begin, um, we'll be discussing a topic called index theory today. If um, you have not handed in your homework yet, let's do it at the end of the lecture. And I also have some old homeworks here that were not picked up. So if you think you may have some of those, come check up here at the end. So index theory uh, is a different sort of topic than what we've covered so far. In, in looking at two-dimensional systems, we have mostly focused on what are called local methods, meaning um, like linearization, looks at a fixed point and then the immediate neighborhood around the fixed point, really the infinitesimal neighborhood of the fixed point. So index theory, in contrast, does not just confine itself to the immediate neighborhood, but, but looks at the whole global phase portrait and gives information at long distance. It's pretty interesting, actually. So um, it's one of the few methods we have for this. Uh, global info about the phase portrait. Um, and until now, we've focused on local methods. Of which the, as I say, the, the main example is linearization, which um, depends on information in the um, infinitesimal neighborhood of a fixed point. So let's um, begin by saying what, what we're talking about. What is index theory? I mean, what is an index, first of all? This, by the way, if you've taken any courses in topology, this will remind you of things you learned in topology. Or if you took a course in complex analysis and learned the idea of winding numbers, uh, or also things that come up in the residue theorem, they're all very similar in spirit because they're all topological. Uh, in physics, it will remind you of Gauss's law in electricity for electrostatics. Um, so you'll see what I mean as we go. All right, so the first concept is the index of a closed curve. We'll first talk about the index of a closed curve, then we'll talk about the index of a point. But for now, index of a closed curve, which we'll call C, um, well, first let's talk about what C should be. C is going to be what is known as a simple closed curve. So simple means it doesn't intersect itself. That is, something like this would be simple. Um, this is not simple. Because of the self-crossing. So we're only going to consider simple closed curves. And um, now these closed curves could be trajectories of the dynamical system, but they don't have to be. And typically, they will not be. So we'll say not necessarily a closed trajectory. You should think of the, the closed curve as being analogous to what in um, electrostatics or even in fluid mechanics they call a Gaussian surface. That is, it's, a, it's a, an object that you put into a vector field to probe what's going on there. Um, so simple closed curve, not necessarily a closed trajectory. And one other thing is um, it should not pass through a fixed point. Or that is to say, there's no fixed point on the curve C. So which does not pass through a 
fixed point. All right, now, um, so here we are. Here's some closed curve sitting in our vector field. And at each point in space, there's a, a vector in the vector field. Like, let's say that it doesn't have to look normal to the curve. It could be tangent to the curve or whatever. So here's some vector defined by x dot y dot. And that's at this point, x, y, on the curve. And um, so then we want to define an angle, which will be, if we have the x dot, y dot looking like this, draw the dashed horizontal line and then define this angle, phi, like that. So in in terms of formulas, phi would be the arctan of y dot over x dot. Right, tangent of phi is, is y dot over x dot. Uh, now the thing we're interested in is as we go around this closed curve once, counterclockwise, Keep your eye on the vectors and ask, I like suppose we start here. Um, as I go around, the vector will change its direction. And notice that the chalk is, is turning. So we want to ask, after we go all the way around, how many full revolutions has the chalk made? That's the key question. So let's define that thing. Um, So as our, our point x, I'll write it as x vector, goes around c once counterclockwise, it doesn't really matter about counterclockwise, but that's the convention. So let's suppose we always go around counterclockwise. Um, then phi changes continuously, this angle. changes continuously if um, if x dot and y dot are continuous functions of x, which they are because we're always assuming that our vector field is continuously differentiable. So, um, so if these are continuous functions of x, then the angle itself will be a continuous function of the position x. And then, as I say, we're going to look at the total change in phi. So I'm going to use this symbol, square brackets, phi sub c. Let that be the net change in phi. When we go around c. And then that's going to be some integer multiple of 2 pi because the arrow comes back to its starting place. And so whatever we've done, we've gone through some full number of revolutions. And so let's divide by 2 pi to get that number. That's called the index. Then i sub c is 1 over 2 pi, the net change in phi. So it's the index of the vector field, or we could say the index of C with respect to the vector field defined by x dot, y dot, which is given to us from our differential equation. So um, let me do a few examples. Is there any questions so far about anything in the definition? OK, so let's try an example or two. Suppose we have a, a vector field that looks sort of like this. And uh, I want to probe 
this vector field, and I do it by drawing a closed curve in here. That's not a necessarily a circle, just some closed curve. So there's C. And now we could ask, what's the index on that one? Um, so there's a few ways of thinking about it. I mean, one is you could just sort of try to do it in your mind. Um, or you can draw, you know, with your pencil or your pen, like let's start here. So keep your eye on the chalk. It was pointing sort of east, a little bit south. We go around, and notice we're turning counterclockwise. I'm always keeping my chalk lined up with the arrow. And so by the time I've come back, what happened? How many revolutions were made? One. And in which sense? Was it a clockwise revolution or a counterclockwise? So watch again. It was going this way, right? It's going counterclockwise. So when we went around the curve counterclockwise, our arrow also went counterclockwise one whole revolution. So we would say this has an index of plus one. That is, the net change of phi was two pi. And so the index is plus one. It's rot the arrows are rotating in the same sense as the um, traversal of the curve. If you didn't really see that, another way you could always do this, though you, you probably don't need to, is you can just number the vectors. And then um, parallel transport them to have a common origin. That is, keep, have all of their tails coming out of the same point. So just let's copy for a second. So I would put one something like this. Two is about like this. Three is kind of like that. Four. Anyway, this, this should make it pretty clear if it wasn't already clear. Um, so seven is about like that. So as you go in order of the numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, obviously you went counterclockwise, one full revolution. Okay, did you have a question? Uh, the question is, is this related to the curl of the vector field? Um, it's certainly true that curl picks up something about the local rotation of the vector field around a point. Um, but, and, and there are connections actually between the curl and the index um, involving certain integral theorems that we could quote, but I don't want to get into them right now. But keep in mind, curl is defined at a point, whereas the index is defined along a curve. So this is a more global concept than curl at the moment. Is there another um, question? Okay, so let's, there's, that was one example. Let's try another one. Suppose that the vector field looks something like this. Okay, so that's a pretty different pattern. Um, now, it's not so easy to draw a closed curve that goes through those endpoints, but, you know, of the, of the arrows. But let's suppose I just draw something like this. The vectors on here by continuity will probably look something like so. So what about that case? What are we getting? Let's try doing this with, I don't know, let's start here at due east again. And the vector is pointing, maybe it's easier, I don't know, is it easier with your finger? So my fingertip is pointing east. Now watch what happens as I start going around counterclockwise. Do you see which way I'm rotating? I'm actually rotating down, that is clockwise. Even though I'm moving counterclockwise, around the curve, my, my finger is rotating <laughs> clockwise. Can, did you see that? Is there any question about that? You want to just number a few points? Like how about we say this one in here is one, here is two, here is three. I don't want to do all of them. And here is four. Whoops. There is four. So one was like this. 2 was like that, 
three was like this, um, and four was north. So notice as I went counterclockwise around the curve, the arrows are rotating once in the opposite sense clockwise. So we would say that this has um, an index of plus, sorry, negative one because of the opposite sense of rotation. This one was plus one. And um, yeah, okay, so those are probably enough examples to get us started. Now I want to develop a few properties of the index which will explain why it's a useful thing and not just some number that you can calculate. I should do one other simple example before we do some properties. What if you just had a flow that was sort of not doing much of anything? Just kind of going in one direction, maybe with some slight variations. So there I hope it's clear to you that if you, um, you know, were to draw a closed curve in that kind of a pattern, the vectors aren't really rotating much at all. And when we go around, one whole circuit, this is going to make zero net revolutions. Is that clear? Right. So you can have an index of zero. And that's fine. So, I mean, that's possible. In fact, you can have any index. It could be any integer. You can cook up examples where you can get any number you, you're, any integer you're interested in. Okay, anyway, so properties of the index. So these are little theorems, some of which I'll just state, and some I'll try to give you an idea of what the proof is without going into great rigor on the proof. So the first property, I think, I won't prove at all, but it has to do with um, what if the closed curve is itself a trajectory? That is, um, What if, when we draw this closed curve, it happens that the vectors are everywhere tangent to the curve, as they would be on a trajectory? So if you have that, I mean, maybe you can see that as we go around the curve once, counterclockwise, the arrows will also rotate once, counterclockwise. So it turns out to be a theorem that any closed trajectory has an index of plus one. So as I say, I'm not going to prove that, but maybe it's plausible from the picture and it turns out to be true in general. And remember, we're, we're interested in closed trajectories because they represent periodic behavior of a dynamical system. Yes? Cannot be minus, the question was, could it be minus one? Not on a closed trajectory, no. So, yeah, I mean, we probably ought to cook up the proof. There, if you want to see some proofs of the various things I'm going to say, um, the book by Jordan and Smith on nonlinear differential equations has pretty clear treatment. And I, I think I have other references in the book um, in section 6.8. Well, no, it really has to be plus one on a closed trajectory. Okay, now number two um, is that the index has a kind of additivity property to it. So it's additive if we subdivide the curve C. So let me explain what I mean by that. Let's suppose I, I have a closed curve there's my C, and I'm going to calculate the index around that curve. And imagine I break up the curve into two pieces by drawing a bridge like that. That is, instead of the original curve C, um, I now think of having two closed curves, 
one of which, um, say this one, think of as being the curve C, C1. That is, it refers to this part here. And then C2 would be this other curve over on this side that kind of, let's say, goes like this. But again, we always go counterclockwise on the curve. So in a certain sense that I hope is obvious from the picture, you can kind of think of C as being the, the union of C1 and C2. I'll just write it as C1 plus C2, where I hope you understand what I mean by how to add curves. I'm adding curves with this common bridge between them. And so then the claim is that if, if C has this relationship to C1 and C2, then the index around C is just the index around C1 plus the index around C2. And the, the proof of that, or at least the idea of the proof of that, should be pretty intuitive, which is it's something like this. that um, OK, so the vectors are doing something on this portion of the arc. And whatever they're doing, that's fine. Let them make some change. But then the interesting part is here. When we go here, the vectors you know, are, are changing in some way in their direction. So there's some net change in the angle. But notice that when we go on C2, we traverse that same bridge, but in the opposite sense. Here we were going down on the bridge. On C2, we're going up on the bridge. So whatever the change in phi was going down, it's the same as the change going up, except with a negative sign. And so when we add um, the change in phi, the bridge will cancel out. The contribution from the bridge will cancel out. And so that's why you'll get that the index around C is just the sum of the indices on the two curves. Did you follow that? You want me to write something down? Yes? The question was, there are sharp corners the way I've drawn it, like here and here. Do we care about that? Um, it doesn't cause any problem, really, because um, the vector field is continuous. And um, that means that the vector you know, at a point like this is essentially pointing in the same direction as at this corner. And you know, the vectors aren't changing radically in their direction even, or their length, even though we're going around a corner. So you can define the change in the phi without any problem, even though there's a corner. It doesn't cause any trouble. Yes? Can the bridge have a fixed point on it? Um, the bridge cannot have a fixed point on it either, because we're, we want to define i on C1 and C2. And so those curves can't have fixed points either. Right. Any other questions there? So OK, I hope that's believable to you, that, that it works like this. Um, so, so to speak, the, the point is that the contribution, so this is true because the contribution to um, the change in phi on the bridge um, is counted twice. once you know positively and once negative okay that's the idea you can write that out for yourself if you if you need to think about it more anyway so we have that nice additive property we also have a nice continuity property which is this one that if um, if we deform C continuously C is deformed continuously into a new curve. Let's call it C prime. That doesn't mean anything about derivative. It just means a new curve, C, um, without passing through a fixed point during the deformation. Then um, the index doesn't change. That is, the index of the original curve C is the same as the index of the deformed curve C prime. 
So if you continuously move a curve, closed curve, you're not going to change its index as long as you don't pass through any fixed points. Um, this one I think I actually will give pretty close to a real proof because it's easy and interesting. Um, this, by the way, should sort of remind you of the flavor of Gauss's law in electrostatics where if you have a, the Gaussian surface and you're calculating the flux through it, then you know from Gauss's law that only depends on the amount of charge inside. So if you start deforming the surface but you don't move it in a way that encloses or loses any charge, you won't change the flux. And it's kind of similar to this. We're not going to change the index by moving the curve around. So let's see why this is true. This is actually an argument you'll see in, in your pure math classes, and it's, um, it's a seductive little argument. It's so easy, you can hardly believe this is really the proof, but it is. So, um, okay, so skipping some technical points. The first thing is that I sub C depends continuously on C. That is, what I mean by that is, imagine changing the curve C just a little bit. Um, so visually, you know, if, if the original C looked like this, imagine, let's say, shrinking it. That'd be one way to deform it. But, but only shrink it a little bit. Then if you change the curve slightly, what will happen? Well, the vectors will all change slightly, too, because we know that only slightly because the vector field is continuous with respect to position. Okay, so all the vectors point by point will change a little bit. And therefore, the change in phi, when you go around the curve, will also change only a little bit from what it was originally. That's what continuity means, right? That if I, if I want to make the change in phi or in the index arbitrarily small, I can do that by making an arbitrarily small deformation of the curve. So it's all just because of the continuity of the vector field itself. So there's, I mean, writing it out properly would take more work, but I hope it's intuitively believable that, that I sub C is a continuous function of C itself. Now, that's not yet the proof. Um, the next thing is to say that, um, but I sub C is an integer. Okay, it's not a real number, an arbitrary real number, it's an integer. We know that it's an integer because when you start with the arrow pointing some direction and you go around the curve, you end up pointing in the same direction. You're back to your starting point and the vector field is single valued. So what has happened in between is you made some integer number of revolutions. It cannot be fractional by the continuity of the vector field. So if you have an integer function that's continuously valued, sorry, I said that wrong. If you have a continuous function that's integer valued, it has to be a constant. Um, implies I sub C can't change. Well, or well, I'll just say it this way. It's constant as we vary C. And so I sub C equals I sub C prime. Let me give you that last point maybe a little more visually. Suppose I have a function that I know is integer valued. Here are some integers. 0, 1, negative 1, 2, whatever. And then um, think of this axis as some variable. If you want, you could call it S which is measuring where we are in the deformation process. Like when s is 0, we're at the original curve c. 
And then as we start turning the S knob, we're deforming the curve. And then by the time we get to S equals 1, we have deformed the curve into, say, C prime. Here's C prime, here's C. So in, in topology, we would say S is a homotopy parameter. But you don't need that jargon. It's just a thing that measures the progress of the deformation. But here's the point that we started at some integer, which doesn't matter what it is. Let's suppose it was 1. And now we're going to do something that's continuous as a function of S, because IC depends continuously on C. So it's continuous. Well, it's got to stay constant, right? I mean, otherwise, if it's integer valued, it would have to jump to something else that was an integer. That's not a continuous function of S. So that's it. I mean, it's just this basic principle. If you have an integer valued function that is continuous, it must be constant. And so that's it. This, this picture is impossible. It's going to be staying constant all the way to there when we're at C prime. OK, is there any question about that reasoning? Sort of seems like cheating, but it really is correct. OK, so then, um, so you don't change the, the index by deforming the curve as long as you don't go through a fixed point. By the way, where did we use that? So where is the assumption used that we did not deform the curve through a fixed point? I said without passing through a fixed point. Wh where was that used? Yes? As you pass through a fixed point, something is not necessarily continuous. What is not? I sub C is not necessarily continuous as you pass through a fixed point. True. Why not? What's not defined? I sub C is not defined if C contains a fixed point. And, and what's the problem? I mean, what stops us from defining it? If I had a fixed point sitting here, I, of course, I don't know what kind of fixed point. But, but the thing is, what's the length of the vector there? Zero, right? It's a fixed point. So how do I define the angle phi? That's the kind of the problem, right? That, that you, in order to define phi, we needed a vector of non-zero length. If, phi has no, if, if this vector has no length, you can't really define phi. So that's, that's one of the problems. That's probably the big problem. So yeah, so we, we um, don't want to pass through a fixed point when we're doing this, because then our, our index is not defined for, because the phi is not defined at that point. Uh, OK. So fine, let's leave that. Now, one other thing is, so I guess I'm up to number four, property four. Suppose that C does not enclose a fixed point. Um, that is, there are no fixed points inside. If C does not enclose a fixed point, then um, any idea what the statement is? The index of C will have to be 0. And the argument is that, well, take C, start shrinking it down, uh, and just keep shrinking it down to a point, or at least to a tiny circle. And there's no obstacle because there's no fixed points inside. So we take our closed curve and start shrinking it, and now it's this very small closed curve. Um, and on a very small closed curve, all the vectors basically point the same direction by continuity of the vector field. Right? So on a tiny closed curve, there's no way for the, the vectors to make a full revolution in any sense. And so that means that I sub C prime is 0 on a tiny C prime that also does not enclose any fixed points. And so I sub C originally must have been 0 by this property 3 that we didn't change I sub C during the deformation. All right, so then one last comment is um, you might think that this index is telling you something about stability, but it's not. It's not actually related to that. It's, it's picking up something else.
So um, here's a nice way to say it. Suppose we reverse the sign of time. If t goes to minus t, um, all the arrows in the vector field rotate by 180 degrees. Or to put it another way, um, whatever the x dot was as a vector, it will now go to minus x dot. And that means that phi will change at each point by going to phi plus pi, which means that the net change in phi stays the same. because you've just added pi to everything. And so it all cancels out when you take the net change in phi around the curve. So if you reverse the sense of time, you don't change the index. But of course, if you reverse the sense of time, something that was an attracting point, like say this one, when we reverse time, will become a repelling point. Yet the index hasn't changed around, you know, say if we had a closed curve encircling that point. So it doesn't tell you about stability index as such. not related to stability per se, but it is related to something else, which we can see if we um, try to talk about the index of a point. I mean, now that we have the idea of the index of a curve, let's talk about an index of a point. And as you can probably suspect, index has something to do with the fixed points inside the curve, just like in Gauss's theorem, um, it has to do with the charges inside the Gaussian surface whether you have positives or negatives in there. Is there any question before we talk about the index of a point? OK, so now let's see. How do we define the index of a point? Well, you can probably guess what we should do. We want to do something like this construction. We want to take the index of a closed curve that contains that point, shrink it down till it just contains, you know, it's very close to that point. Actually, that's enough. If you just have a closed curve, it doesn't even have to be tiny. Um, any closed curve that encloses just one fixed point, that's the index of that point. So that is um, index of a point P equals I sub C for any C that encloses Um, P and no other fixed points. Now, um, why does that make sense? So I'm using here this property three. That is, this is well defined by the property three. When I say it's well defined, what I mean is if I think about this point P and I think about some closed curve C that encloses it, this index on C will be the same as this index on C prime because there are no fixed points in between C and C prime. So nothing will change. And we can imagine doing this all the way down till just an infinitesimal neighborhood of the point P at which stage, it's clear that we're now just talking about the index at P itself. There's no other points that can really affect it. Um, excuse me, I'm getting a little hot here. So let's try this. It's usually pretty freezing in this room, not today. OK. So anyway, that's now the idea that we can, we can calculate the index at a point. And Let's just do that for a few examples. We already did a little bit of that 
I mean implicitly by drawing vector fields that probably reminded you of vector fields near nodes or saddles. But as you can check that the index of a node will be plus one. That, that's a lot like the vector field we had originally. We drew something like that. That'd be the index of an unstable node. But it's also true for a stable node by this comment five that we just made. You can check that the index of a saddle is minus one which was the second example we did where we had flow that looked sort of like like this. Right, which looks like there wants to be a saddle point sitting inside there. So um, we're seeing plus one with node, minus one with saddle. If you check the other cases, you'll see that the index of a spiral comes out to be plus one. And so does a center. Um, if we have an ordinary point that's not a fixed point, we mentioned that uh, that will have an index of zero. That's going to just give us a flow that looks, you know, like that. It's not really changing in the neighborhood of a point that's not a fixed point. So this is kind of easy to remember if you look at our diagram of um, trace and determinant in the linearization. That is, uh, we had this picture, determinant, trace, um, all the stuff with index plus one lives over here on the whole right half plane. Right, the centers, nodes, and spirals, they're all over there, whereas the saddles live over here on the left half plane. They all have index equals minus one. And then there are these, remember that the <clears throat> we have this funny case on this axis where we have non-isolated fixed points in the linearization. And we can't really define the index there because uh, we won't have isolated fixed points, so we won't be able to draw a closed curve that encloses only that fixed point and no others. So that, that's what sort of allows it to jump from minus one to plus one as we move continuously through this plane. We go through a region where we don't, can't define the index on the, the delta equals zero line. Now, here's an interesting theorem. This is, this is where it starts to get to be useful for us. So far, it's not so clear what good does this do us in dynamical systems. Um, yes? No, there, the, the question is, can there be an, can we have a fixed point with an index of two or greater? or negative two or less. Yes, we can, but not in the ordinary classification of fixed points as nodes, saddles, and so on. But there's, there are interesting fixed points. Like if you look at the vector fields for, um, there's a home, I don't know if I assigned it for homework, maybe not. There's a nice way to construct them in complex notation. If you write z dot equals z to the n, where you then write z equals x plus i y, and derive a, an xy vector field from that. Let's just do one quickly. Suppose I had z dot equals z squared. So in, in um, xy notation, that would say x dot plus iy dot is then when you square x plus iy, you'll get x squared minus y squared plus i 2xy. And so the vector field that corresponds to this z dot example is um, x dot is x squared minus y squared. And y dot is uh, 2xy. And so that thing, its linearization would just be, as you can see, if I linearize this about x, y equals zero, the linearization would be a matrix of all zeros. So the linearization doesn't know anything about what's going on here. It just 
classifies this system as being here. It thinks there's a plane of fixed points. But that's not right. There's only a, a single fixed point at the origin. But if you um, draw the vector field, I think you'll find that the index comes out to either be plus 2 or minus 2. I'm not sure which. You'll have to check. And then by doing the same thing with n, you can get an index of n or minus n. I think the other case is if you do z dot is, um, maybe we should do something like z to the minus n, or maybe it's z bar. No, I don't remember. Do I do z to the minus n? Maybe. Or maybe I do z. I forget. Um, anyway, you can cook up examples. If you want to know what would such a weird fixed point look like, here's one that you might want to calculate something about. You, you may have seen it in physics in problems with dipoles. If you had a, um, a flow that looks sort of like this, and then you have a bunch of smaller guys that do the same thing. You can just kind of keep going to fill up the whole plane with this. If you study this fixed point and calculate its, whoops, did I draw a bad one up there? Yeah, I did. That arrow's going the wrong way. It's going this way. Calculate the index around that point. I think you'll get a 2 or a negative 2. So we haven't seen anything like this, but they can, of course, occur. OK. Any other question? Now, so I was about to say that there's a nice little theorem, which is so far just empty, not <laughs> the, uh, the empty theorem. No, let's, let's go over to this place. I didn't say anything false, though. Um, the theorem I meant to say was that uh, any closed trajectory, and we're still talking in the plane, so I'll just emphasize that, on R2, um, must enclose fixed points. And more than that, it must enclose fixed points um, whose indices add up to plus 1. Um, sum of the index equals plus 1. Maybe I should think of it as that there's a discrete set of um, n fixed points, and they're all isolated. Let's keep it simple. So say uh, k equals 1 up to n, and here's i sub k. So this is a, maybe something you've suspected until now, that there's something going on with closed trajectories and fixed points inside. Like we had this picture, um, remember with the double well oscillator, we had a picture like this with these big closed trajectories. And then we had little closed trajectories. Like that. And then there was a saddle point in here in a homoclinic orbit. So I, I think you probably, I may have the arrows backward from what we did at the time. But, but anyway, so remember a phase portrait like this? And we had, um, a, we had a center here, and a center here, and a saddle point. Uh, yes? Uh, we, the question was, do the fixed points have to be isolated? I, yes, I'd like them to be isolated so that I can calculate their index. It's, I, I'm not sure that we, strictly speaking, have to have that. But well, let's just consider that. That's the generic case. Um, OK, so anyway, back to this case. So we had a saddle here at the origin. And so if you think about the picture, we had these various closed trajectories with, um, you know, like we had a plus sitting inside there, a plus 1, 
sitting inside here. Here's a minus one at the origin. And then we also allowed closed trajectories. I mean, we have the big one, which encloses, notice, a plus, a plus, and a minus. Maybe I should just say a minus. And that adds up to plus one, right? So that's allowed. Or these individually just enclose a plus, so that's OK. But we, we cannot have a closed trajectory that would enclose a plus and a minus. That would not be possible, because that would add up to 0 inside, no good. So how do we know this theorem? I mean, you can sort of see it comes from things we already said. If you have a closed trajectory, we said that um, I sub C on a closed trajectory is plus 1. And then how do we know that the sum of the fixed points inside have to, their indices have to sum to 1? Do you see why? Why would that be true? Rule 3 about chopping up the curve. Right, so, so if we have this closed trajectory, like let's take the big peanut-shaped one. On here, it, it adds up to plus 1. So you could draw a picture like, you know, zonk, zonk, and then calculate the indices around these three closed curves, and you would get, now there's only one fixed point inside each of them. And um, we know we can do this subdivision, and then you can calculate the indices for each of those and so on. So it's, it's just because you can subdivide the curve um, from that property 3, and from the fact that the closed trajectory itself has index plus 1. So this is a really nice theorem because it makes a constraint on, on what uh, is possible inside a closed trajectory. And another thing where it comes in handy is sometimes we'll have a dynamical system and we'll say, I don't think there are any closed trajectories in this problem, but you're not sure and you can rule them out using this kind of argument. So here's an example of that. Let's. Um, Let's look at the case of uh, the predator. No, I guess it was a competition model. It was our rabbits versus sheep problem. If you recall, we had um, so you can use index theory sometimes to rule out closed trajectories. So as an example, recall the old rabbits versus sheep problem, where we had the vector field x dot equals x times 3 minus x minus 2y. And y dot was y 2 minus x minus y. <clears throat> And we decided that our phase portrait, I mean, if we just think about the fixed points, let's see, we had a stable node here, a stable node here, but these invariant lines on the axes. Um, there was a saddle point here. So that's a little fixed point there. These guys, the nodes, would be plus 1. Here's a plus 1. We had an unstable node at the origin. So there's a plus 1 there. And so you could ask, where could there be closed orbits in this picture? I mean, given that a closed orbit has to encircle fixed points um, that's, whose indices add up to 1, you know, conceivably there could be a closed orbit like this. But actually, that's not possible, is it? Because this closed trajectory would go through this invariant line. That's not possible. Trajectories can't cross. Right? We said that. So you cannot have this. And you also can't have, this by the same argument, any closed trajectory that encircles these or, or this plus more. I mean, something like this is ruled out for all kinds of reasons. It's ruled out because it would cross these trajectories, but also because the sum of the indices inside would be 0. You can't have something that just encloses this, because that would have a minus 1 inside. That's no good. 
So you get the idea. I mean, you, you can be sure that there are no closed orbits in this problem. Yes? The question was, why are we sure a closed orbit um, couldn't it have no fixed points inside? But no, we said earlier that that was theorem one that I didn't prove, that a closed trajectory has index plus one. I didn't prove it, but, but it's true that a closed trajectory always has index plus one. So um, that would mean that the sum of the indices of the fixed points inside have to be plus one. And if there are no fixed points, that, that thing will add up to zero, not plus one. Because ordinary points have index zero, not one. Um, OK. So at this point, I'm sort of done with what I say in the book about index theory. But there are always a few strange things I feel like mentioning that um, I don't know. It won't help you with your homework, but I just think it's interesting. So can I just tell you some weird stuff? Why not? OK. <laughs> I mean, let me tell you the weirdest of all first, uh, which has to do with biology. It's not exactly index theory, but it's in the spirit of um, index theory. If you read a paper by Leon Glass that appeared in Science 1977, um, it's volume 198 page 321. Let me just summarize the part that I find amazing in there. It, he's, he's a mathematical biologist, and he was using index-style arguments to understand some experiments that developmental biologists had done. So um, you may know about certain creatures called salamanders um, or newts. They have this amazing ability to regenerate limbs. So like if you, if you cut off say, their front left paw, then it will grow back. It's weird. I mean, we don't do that. Human mammals have trouble with that. Human beings can't particularly do it. But a salamander, no problem. OK, so that's, that's kind of interesting in terms of how organs and structures develop in biology. And the kind of sinister experiments that biologists like to do would be, and they have done, is um, Suppose I chop off both hands, and now I graft the right hand onto the left stump. Okay, so they've done that experiment. You take this right hand, sew it on here. Can you guess what will happen? Think about it as an index problem. Which, by the way, there's a wicked pun in there, of course, because index refers to your. Okay, okay. okay. But anyway, but um, amazingly, it works this way, that, that the left stump has a kind of index of minus 1, and the right stump has a kind of index of plus 1. I don't know what that means exactly, but it seems to work like this. So when you put the right hand on the left, you're now off by 2. And so this will grow two more left hands. Okay, Out of the wrist, with the right hand sewn on there, will come out two left hands, one to cancel the offending right hand. <laughs> And then one to put the left hand that belongs there. That's really true. And, and there's other weird stuff that are, cannot be made sense of unless you think in these kind of index terms. OK, weird. But anyway, so you could look that up. And, and then he cites the biology papers where you can check the data and the photographs and stuff to see that, that this is real. Um, OK, so that's one bizarro thing. And, and he gives a kind of argument you know, mathematically that explains all the weird stuff that's been seen in the experiments. Another point that you might be interested in is more of a mathematical point, which is that we've been talking about the plane, but there's index theory on other two-dimensional surfaces. So um, you've probably heard of the thing called the hairy ball theorem. Yes. So, OK, well, <laughs> right. So what's the hairy ball theorem? It, it has to do with, um, we draw a, I mean, the hairy ball theorem is a specific one for a sphere where you put a vector field on the surface of a sphere, again, continuously differentiable. And then the sum of the indices of the fixed points on the sphere will always add up to plus 2. So like, here's a nice vector field on a sphere. Take the sphere, um, take hot fudge sauce, pour it on the top, 
and let it start slowly oozing down. So the vector field looks you know, like this. It's coming down, it's oozing, and then it collects down here at the bottom. It can't come, doesn't drip. It stays on the surface of the sphere. So I'm just drawing this nice vector field that is just flowing downward on the sphere so that there's a sink, an attracting point down here, a repelling point up there, and there's no other fixed points on the sphere. And of course, this is a plus one, this is a plus one. That adds up to plus two. The statement is that for any vector field on the sphere, the sum of the indices will always be plus two. And why is it, you know, the hairy ball theorem, they say, well, if you think of these vectors as like hairs, and like take the top of my head, um, if, I, if, if my head were a complete sphere, including my face, you know, I'm detached from my neck, and so on. If my whole head was covered in hair, forget about the head. I mean, it's <laughs> just if you just had a sphere covered with hair, and then you tried combing it so that it didn't have any zeros, no, that is, no fixed points in the vector field, there's no way to comb it because um, if it had no fixed points, the sum of the indices would be zero, but it's not. It has to always be plus two. On the other hand, it is possible to comb a torus. So that's interesting because. Uh, if you have a torus with hair sticking up, you can just comb the hair all the way around, you know, like that, and it's just a nice swirly, uh, very well-groomed torus with no cowlick. So that's an interesting thing, that you can comb a torus but not a sphere, and it's, I think, related, though maybe someone can correct me if I'm wrong, to what the people do in plasma physics, where they make tokamaks, um, you know, for containing fusion in the shape of a toroidal containment. That you don't want to contain uh, something as hot as the sun in a sphere because the electric field or the magnetic field that's used for the containment will have zeros according to this and the, and the stuff will get out. Whereas if you use a toroidal shaped container, you can arrange it so that the field has no places where it's zero and then you can keep the thing in there. So I think that's related. I'm not positive of that. But anyway, so that's the general fact then is not this two, but um, it's that the sum of the indices is two minus a quantity called two times g, where g is um, called the genus of the surface. And in plain language, it's the number of handles. So what do I mean by a handle? Okay, so in topology, they would say that a sphere is a thing with genus zero. It doesn't have any handles. Whereas if I take a sphere with a handle, like you want to walk around carrying the sphere, so there's the handle attached. Let's see, so there's this handle sticking up. Do, do you see what I'm trying to draw? Like you could walk around holding it, like a, like a bag, like a handbag. Except it's just got this one handle. Anyway, to a topologist, this sphere with the handle on it can be deformed into a, into a torus by sort of sucking the air out of the big balloon part. So a torus is considered genus one. And then something with genus two would be like a double hole torus that looks like this. And so on. You can have as many handles as you want. So anyway, these. Um, this statement that the sum of the indices is 2 minus 2g, two um, that's a thing called the Poincare Hopf index theorem. And so that's a very nice one. Works on any orientable two manifold compact. So that's just, that, as you can see, this is the beginning of differential topology, this kind of idea. Um, so if you take some topology, you'll run into that. Okay, so I think that's about all I want to say on index theory, unless there's any question. Um, sometimes the question comes up, does it only work for two-dimensional surfaces? Is there a generalization of the index to three-dimensional or higher-dimensional spaces? There is. There's something called degree theory, but um, I've never seen it used in dynamical systems. So I, I don't think it affects us so much, but it does exist in topology. Okay, anyway, but um, I think it's also not an accident that Poincaré is 
is not only like the founder of modern dynamical systems, but also modern topology. He's thinking about the same kinds of things. Um, I mean, he used a lot of topological ideas in his differential equations work. So, okay, I'm going to leave index theory there. I, I want to throw in a couple more points um, about something else. And then um, I'll collect homework from people who didn't hand it in yet. So now we're jumping into the next chapter. We're in chapter 7, which has to do with limit cycles. And this will take us a little bit of time. These are very important closed trajectories that are um, isolated. So by saying isolated, what I mean here is that the neighboring trajectories are not closed. So unlike a center, you know, the picture we have on the phase portrait in the neighborhood of a center, we have all lots of a continuous family of closed curves, closed trajectories. We're not talking about that. We're, we're talking about something where there's a closed trajectory, but then the neighboring trajectories do something like that. They spiral out asymptotically approaching this closed trajectory. That's where the term limit cycle comes from. This, this cycle is the limit of this spiraling trajectory inside it. And also, typically, the, the trajectories outside will also spiral down and approach the, um, the limit cycle. So this kind of picture would be called a stable, the closed curve here is a stable limit cycle. There, there are also unstable limit cycles. You could have something like, here's a closed curve that um, repels the neighboring trajectories away from it. All right, so that'd be unstable. Those are less important, but, but still we need to be able to deal with them. And then in pathological cases, or sometimes with certain types of bifurcations, you can create half-stable limit cycles that are stay stable from the inside, but unstable from the outside. So that, that can occur. That'd be rare, though. So there's half-stable cycle. Here's a unstable cycle. And why do we care about these? Um, well, these limit cycles represent periodic behavior of a system that is, in a sense, um, let's just focus on the stable ones. The stable limit cycles are some kind of periodic motion that this system wants to do. That is, it's drawn to this from a wide range of initial conditions. The system will end up on this loop just going around and around. And so when a system is drawn into some kind of persistent oscillation, you can expect that there's a stable limit cycle operating behind the scenes. Um, so just to list a few examples. You know, whatever your scientific discipline is, you'll run into them. Um, you could, in the case of biology, your own heart is beating um, through a stable limit cycle in the electrical system that, that regulates the heartbeat. Um, you have other biological rhythms of, say, your body temperature, which goes up and down throughout the day. Um, and even if you're in constant conditions, lying in a hospital room with carefully regulated feeding and external temperature and sunlight and everything. I mean, even if everything else is kept constant, your body has lots of limit cycles in it in control of all kinds of involuntary functions, hormone rhythms and so on. So in, in engineering, you know, we run into them a lot in feedback control systems, sometimes go into unwanted oscillations. Um, sometimes they're desirable. It depends what you're trying to do. 
in the case of airplane wings, there's a phenomenon called aeroelastic flutter, which I'll show a movie of in a few lectures, um, where, you know, imagine your consternation if you're looking out the window and you see the wings kind of jiggling like that. They're usually not supposed to do that. They're, they're not birds. They're not supposed to flap. But um, that can happen if you fly a plane too fast, way beyond its design specs. So I'll show you some interesting footage of that. Uh, there are sometimes unwanted vibrations in bridges, um, other kinds of mechanical vibrations. A very familiar one is like the um, if we had the windows open and we had Venetian blinds and the wind is blowing steadily across the blinds. Sometimes you hear them going, did it, did it, did right. So the clatter of, of blinds, even though they're being driven steadily by a constant wind, is a, a self-excited oscillation. It's not that they're being driven periodically. They're driven at a constant force, yet they start to spontaneously oscillate. Um, so fluttering blinds. Chemical oscillations. We'll see some movies of those too and analyze them. Anyway, we could go on and on. But so these are, you know, we're changing periodically. You've probably seen this like maybe in a high school chemistry class where there's a reaction that changes color, goes blue, and then a few seconds later it goes yellow, then it goes back to blue. Kind of amazing. Um, okay, so maybe I'll get into the math of that next time. Um, I think, hmm, can I just make one last point, actually, which is that linear systems don't have limit cycles. This is a really quintessentially nonlinear phenomenon that, um, you know, you have not probably run into unless you studied some nonlinear dynamics. By linear systems, remember, I'm, I'm just referring, I use the term a little differently from other people. I'm just going to refer to a linear system as something like x dot equals ax where A is a matrix with constant coefficients. Um, if I have that kind of a linear system, this cannot have a limit cycle. And the reason, I'm not saying they can't have closed orbits. They certainly can. The problem is they won't be isolated. So the periodic solutions of systems like this are not isolated. So if periodic solutions exist, say x of t was a periodic solution, um, I mean, if x of t is periodic, the problem is that then so is c times x of t for any c. In other words, what's going to happen is if I have any periodic solution in a linear system, then I'll just get this whole continuous family of them because I can scale them up or down by linearity. Right? That will also satisfy the system. And so that's why in, in simple harmonic oscillator we see pictures like this associated with there being a center. But these are really not, these are not limit cycles because, I mean, the, the thing that's weird about them from a nonlinear perspective is if there's any little noise that kicks you from one to the next, you remember that disturbance forever. You just stay on this new periodic orbit and you don't come back. Whereas in a limit cycle, if you're disturbed, you will come back. And so they're much more robust, the, the limit cycles, than these kind of things. Okay, so next time I'll, I'll start showing you some examples of limit cycles and we'll do some scientific applications.